Welcome to section 20.3 and 20.4. All right, ladies and gentlemen, in this lecture, we're going to start off by talking about nuclear transformations or what we call nuclear transmutations. Now, this kind of harps back to all the way to ancient chemistry with alchemists. And the idea with alchemists is they wanted to take lead into gold or change one element from one thing to another. Now, because of Dalton, this idea was kind of back shelved and people thought you couldn't change one element into another. Right around the 1920s, people started experimenting with the alpha particle. And so you can remember around this time is where Rutherford did his experiment and the idea with him is that he took the alpha particle and was slamming it into gold foil, but he slammed it into other types of foil. And people wanted to know what happens when you start bombarding an element with alpha particles. In the 1920s is when we actually first transformed one element into another element. What experimenters did is they took nitrogen 14, bombarded it with the alpha particle, and what they produced was oxygen 17 and one thing of hydrogen. And so this was the first time people on purpose changed one element into another element. Also note what they were doing here was they were taking one known element and changing it into another known element. So going back to the alchemists, you could make synthetic gold. It, it has been produced synthetically. However, it is cost prohibitive to do it this way. It takes a ton of energy and it's much cheaper to go out and mine for gold. Now, in 1940, what happened is researchers took uranium-238 and started bombarding it with neutrons. And this is the first time we made an artificial element. What they did is they made Neptunium-239. So if you were in 1940 and you were to look at the periodic table, the periodic table stopped at uranium element 92. In nature, they were unable to find any elements that were heavier than uranium. So this Neptunium was the first artificial or synthetic element ever produced. And so from that time on, we've started producing synthetic elements. And you guys can see that if you guys make it, you get to name it. So we have Americanium, Berkelium, Californium, all produced in the state of California at our nuclear colliders. Right now, you guys can see that we've kept on synthesizing new elements and we've actually finished the last row of the periodic table. Now, I want you to understand that these synthetic elements or these artificial elements, these are highly radioactive material. They are not stable and they will actually decay rather fast. Some of these only have lifetimes in the millisecond to nanosecond time regime. And we've only been able to produce like four or five atoms of a certain artificial element. However, there is significant proof that we've created this artificial element, and that's what you see currently on this periodic table on the bottom. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to shift gears, and I want to talk about radio dating. Now, if you've ever wondered how archaeologists date something, one of the tools that they could use is carbon dating, and it is based off of radioactive decay. So here's the story, and we're going to focus on carbon for this particular radio dating. If I were to look at carbon, carbon comes in many isotopes, 12, 13, and 14. 12 is by far the most abundant, 99%, and it is a stable nucleus. Carbon-13 makes up 1%, again, a stable nucleus. Now, the one we're interested in is carbon-14. Carbon-14 is a radioactive material. It goes under beta decay. However, carbon-14 is constantly being made in our atmosphere. If you go up to space, there are neutrons flying around, and so this creates carbon-14, and so there is a steady state of concentration of carbon-14. It is constantly being made, and it is constantly being decayed. That concentration is 10 to the negative 10th percent 
in our atmosphere. So this is a tiny, tiny, tiny percent. So if I look at the carbon in our atmosphere, which is mostly CO2, well, this is the breakdown of the carbon in our atmosphere. Now, what you guys will remember from high school biology is plants take carbon dioxide and turn it into food through photosynthesis. What this means is that the carbon inside plants are derived from the atmosphere. So that means that the isotopic ratio in a plant that's alive is going to be this 99, 1, and 10 to the negative 10th percent. Now, animals are going to eat those plants and thus incorporate that carbon content into their structure. So if you look at a living animal, they will also have this isotopic ratio inside their body because they're deriving their carbon content from the plants, which derive their carbon content from their atmosphere. However, what happens when a plant dies or an animal dies? Well, if a plant and an animal die, they cease all biological function, which means that they are not intaking any more nutrients. The plants are not going to breathe in that CO2, and the animals are not going to continually eat plants. And what happens is all the carbon in that dead plant or that dead animal is the carbon that it was already there. And so this starts a clock. So no new carbon-14 is going to enter the organism. All the carbon-14 in the organism is going to start to decay. So what's going to happen is the amount of carbon-14 is going to continually decrease in that dead animal or plant. And so what researchers do, like archaeologists, is they measure the carbon-14 content. And what they can see is the difference in the isotopic ratio. They see what it should be if it was alive and what it is at its current state. And based on how much carbon-14 has decayed, well, you can use first-order kinetics to back calculate how long you would need to get that kind of concentration. And so in this way, we can go ahead and determine the age of a dead organism. Now, this is based off of carbon-14. There are other radioisotopes that decay that we know the half-lives, and we can base our calculations off those. So one example is if you've ever wondered how they calculated the age of the Earth or the age of the universe, they can use radioactive decay to determine how much time has passed. So I know you guys have been working hard, and if you want a little break, I suggest you go ahead and catch this episode of Cosmos. Cosmos was an educational program developed by Seth MacFarlane, uh, the person that did Family Guy, The Orville, and other such, uh, and other such comedies. Uh, what he did is he got together with Neil deGrasse Tyson, and they rebooted the show. Of particular interest is in Season 1, Episode 7, called The Clean Room. Now, this is the story of the person that calculated the age of the Earth. And it is a real interesting story because he started this project when he was a graduate student. And his project seemed like a very simple project and he was, should have been able to do it really quickly. But there was this complication and it turns out this complication is something that he struggled with and he took to when he was a professor. He tried to figure out the age of the earth and what happened is that there was this pollutant that kept on interfering with his calculation. Now, this pollutant was found in this everyday chemical that a lot of people used. And the story presented in this episode is one where this, this scientist was trying to fight back against these mega corporations that were using this pollutant. Eventually, due to his testimony, that pollutant was outlawed and it is no longer in this commercially available product. Now, some have said this has led to great benefits for society, improving mental health, lowering crime and such. But I don't want to spoil the episode too much for you and what had happened during this. So if you have time, go ahead and check out this episode. And go ahead and see how something tangential, some environmental policy came out 
of trying to figure out the age of our planet. So let's go ahead and end this lecture with an eye clicker question. So this is example 20.2, where I want you to tell me the age of a rock. So when you guys go ahead and finish this, go ahead and mark a right answer, and then we can go ahead and take a look at this quiz question. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are doing radioactive decay, and so this is a first order process. So let's go ahead and write down our integrated rate law for a first order process. Let's go ahead and do a little bit of rearrangement. So I have the concentration at a given time, and I'm gonna bring over A naught, my original concentration, and I'm gonna take the natural log of both sides, which leaves me with this equation right here. So again, this is first order kinetics. So I know my T one half equals 0 0.693, over my rate constant, or in other words, my rate constant equals 0 0.693 over T one half. We can go ahead and combine these equations. And so I am left with this equation right here. So I wanna go ahead and fill in these values. But before that, let's go ahead and think about the process here. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking uranium 238 and uranium-238 is going to decay into lead-206. So let's go ahead and think about this process. I have an initial concentration of uranium-238. Now, some of that uranium-238 is going to decay. And so when it decays, it becomes lead-206. But not all of it decays right away. Some of it just doesn't decay. And so I still have uranium-238 left over. And so what I want you guys to think about is if I had, let's say, 100 uranium-238 originally, if 25 of it decayed into lead-206, well, that means I have 75 uranium-238 left over. So the summation of the leftover uranium-238 plus the decay product gets me my original concentration of uranium. And so this is what I'm gonna do with this set of data. I have a ratio of lead 206 to 238 that your problem gave you. And it said it's 0 0.115. Now this is just a percentage in decimal form. So what I can do is turn this into a fraction. I can say that I have 11.5 lead and I currently have 100 uranium. Now you can look in your book, they use 115 and 1000. It doesn't matter what you choose as long as your ratio remains the same. So if this is the case, I'm ratioing the amount currently of lead to uranium. Well, I can go ahead and plug these numbers to get my original uranium concentration out. So in this case, I had 11.5 lead, 100 uranium currently. So that means I had originally 111.5 of my uranium 238. Now with all this said, we can go ahead and plug in our values into that equation. So I have the LN and I want my concentration of uranium at this time. So that's going to be 100. I want my original uranium concentration. And we just calculated that as 111.5 minus 0 0.693 divided by my half-life, which was given in the problem as 4.5 times 10 to the ninth years. And this is going to be times t, what we are solving for the time. And so if I solve for T, what I get is 7.068 times 10 to the eighth years. So this is the age of the rock. I hope that made sense. And again, Chem 1C, stay safe.